The Big Game. Join us as we remember it all in a special documentary, The Big Game, A Look Back. Coming up next. The following is a presentation of Cartoon Network Sports. Bugs Bunny, Foghorn Leghorn, Squidly Diddly, giants of the game in any age. Who could forget the thrill of seeing a young Speedy Gonzalez running circles around Sylvester in 52? Or the unwanted de pantsing of Ot 6? Or this thing from the 70s? Moments in time that are indelibly etched on the collective consciousness of fans the world over in a contest of wills as distinctly American as, as soccer with the poetry of bowling and the precision of spin the bottle. A game that I can state without exaggeration is better than all those other sports combined times a billion. I'm talking, of course, about the big game. Hello again, everybody. I'm Jim Huber. Over the years, the big game has seen its fair share of heroes, goats, and blue hound dogs. Tonight, we'll look back at the early days, from its birth in a Mississippi flophouse to the marketing behemoth that is the big game today. If you have ever wondered how it all began, or more to the point, why it ever started in the first place, tonight is your lucky night. We will visit with some of the sharpest minds of our age as we try to understand the pomp, the circumstance, and the future of the big game. So set your VCRs, America. This one's a keeper. Way back in the 1880s, America was just finding its way. Labor was cheap. Labor was abundant. Labor was mostly children. But as the children toiled and slaved away in the collar factories and uranium mines, what were the adults to do? Sobering question, but one that was quickly answered by a man lazing in a Mississippi flophouse one August night, a young man named Dazzy McPeat. Dazzy was doodling on old castor oil bottles, creating a stick figure sheep named Sweeney. Then he added a lion, and he knew he had something, and Cartoon Sports was born. And so Dazzy and his brother Abner, with money from his brother's thumb-severing business, formed Stinky Studios in what used to be called New York City. But that business ultimately failed and has nothing at all to do with our story. For at the same time in Los Angeles, leagues were popping up all over. Well, cartoon sports became a thing. You know, everybody was getting rich starting a league. There was Disney, uh, Fleischer had a league, uh, Warner Brothers. MGM. MGM. Warner Brothers was amazing. I mean, think about who we had. We had Daffy, we had Porky, we had Bugs Bunny. They didn't have a script. It, was, it wasn't something that was pre-planned. It, it, they had no idea where they were going or how they were going to get there. They just did it. They jumped in. They, you know, they got both feet involved. Crazed duck, best stuttering pig, 42 to 7. Daffy Mallard dons dress, defies physics. Defies? physics. Now, who does that? Half an hour later, an extremely young Bill Hanna and Joe Barbera met in a sailor bar in Houston, and on a bet, mind you, formed the Hanna-Barbera League. Hanna-Barbera rules. Each league had its own unique style of play, and a rivalry was born. WB players were more animated. I mean, it is true, but the HB League had strategy. It was more of a thinking man's game. Thinking man's game? They're cheap imitations of the WB League. Back in those days, you were either a diehard WB fan or a diehard HB fan. But, hey, nowadays, it's just the opposite. The league started to innovate, and with a nod to the recent Scopes Monkey trial, began to evolve. In the old days, it was simple. It was about the playing. But then Acme gets involved with her anvils, and then the next thing you know, it's catapults, rocket skates, cannons. Changed the game, in my opinion. 
I remember one game over in the short-lived MGM League where they went absolutely nuts with things falling on people. There was a luxury liner and a horse for crying out loud. Can you imagine a horse? Incredible. But I'll tell you one thing, those catapults can really tear up a field. Made my job heck. The nation was booming, and so was the game. And people were dancing to the Red Hot Rag. But then, bam, the Depression hit. It was especially hard on the WB and HB leagues, partly because so many of their players were edible. It wasn't unusual in those days to see characters play on Saturday and then see them in the soup du jour on Sunday. It was a terrible time. We forget uh, Harry the Hare along with Delaware Duck were made into a roast. Chuck Juicy Fried Chicken. I don't know what happened to him, but with a name like that... Uh... Oh, it was a shame. A tasty, tasty shame. But the tide soon changed. The remaining players would escape the frying pan straight into the fires of World War II. Pursuit. We had no choice. We had to serve our country. Genies were especially needed on the front lines. But as the greats traded in their anvils for ammo, who to entertain the folks working back home? The answer, women, cartoon women. Well, this was a chance for all the dames to prove that their skill at the game was equal to the men's. Yes, women's liberation took a giant leap forward until the men returned from war, and it promptly took two steps back. Two steps back into the kitchen, or if they were lucky, the mud wrestling pit. But the sport continued to grow. Cut to 1971. The times they were a-changing, a nation divided. On one side, the establishment, the status quo, the man. On the other side, the long hairs, hippies, yippies, yogis, and yahooies, burning bras and draft cards and mooching picnic baskets from the man. The nation was in turmoil. It needed a solution, or even better, a distraction, a big distraction. Enter Foghorn Leghorn, father of the big game. Foghorn was a natural-born huckster, whether it was conning his way into a hen house or persuading a chicken hawk to do his dirty work. Foghorn was a man who knew how to play the angles. And when he saw the leagues, he saw opportunity. Now, to be more exact, he saw Benjamins. He had a dream, you know. He wanted to unite the leagues into one league with one set of regulations for one big game to decide it all, you know. He also had a dream of going to school in his underwear. But the leagues were controlled by rich men sitting in boardrooms around those big tables. You know, they wouldn't even meet with Foghorn. He was a rooster, for crying out loud. He didn't even have a suit. And this was before Casual Fridays. But Foghorn did have that meeting, and after a heated 14-hour debate, he got what he wanted. How'd he do it? It's still a mystery. Well, mystery in my eye. He was in cahoots with the anthill mob. No, th that's never been substantiated. I can't comment on that. And so the first big game premiered. The year was 1972. Hello, sports fans, and welcome to the first big game. Yogi Bear versus Ranger Smith should be groovy. Yogi's going deep in the picnic basket. Wait. Holy smokes, there's Ranger Smith in for the interception. I'll teach you a lesson, Yogi Bear. Hold on, there's Boo Boo. Little Boo Boo is off into the end zone. As for the final score, it was a blowout, 34 to nothing. It just goes to show Yogi can't fight City Hall or the Parks Department. Going down, Yogi. <sighs> Yogi fights authority. But authority always wins. But despite the uneven matchup, the fans were entertained. Perhaps we saw in Yogi's repeated frustrations a catharsis for our own. Or maybe we just love that cute little boo-boo. Either way, the big game was a hit. So there it was, a four-foot chicken with a dream. A sport just coming out of adolescence. A world hungry for a good-tasting diet soft drink. 
The stage was set then for even more disappointment and misery, especially in the soft drink department. When we return, we'll take a look at the golden age. And then, scandal. Welcome back, everyone. For those of you who have just tuned in, shame on you. Now, we know Americans love three things above all else. Anything by David E. Kelly, loose-fit jeans, and winners. In fact, when given the choice of winning or losing, most red-blooded Americans consistently choose winning. And the history of the big game is no different. Let's take a look, then, at the golden age of the big game with some of our favorite plays and players. OK, come on inside, and we'll show you the facility. Daffy Duck, inventor of the woo-woo defense. <laughs> Jabberjaw invented the woo-woo defense. <laughs> Gloop, Gleep, and the Schmoo. The HB is the only place where you find gelatinous players. Most consecutive appearance is pantless, Porky Pig. I've got Scooby-Doo and his gang. <laughs> Droopy dog. He looks like nothing. Little cute dog. Perhaps the best defensive player of the game. Good. Droopy had actually been known to wait in a lion's stomach for hours just to get the drop on his man. Now that's good D. Droopy always left the locker room spotless with a nickel tip. He was a class act. Not like that floozy Betty Boop. Most Consecutive wins in a season, Bugs Bunny. Most pronoun switching, Bugs Bunny. Who didn't want to be Bugs Bunny when they were a kid? I mean, we were all walking around with carrots in our mouth, you know, going, what's up, Doc? You know? But, you know, we, we never did the drag thing. You know, at least I didn't. His rabbit hole defense was impenetrable. That's big. Got his own cologne. That's how big he is. Huge. Big indeed. But the big game also has another icon, an icon that not only changed the game, but changed society and our hearts as well. I'm speaking, of course, about Squidly Diddly. Until that time, there was a four appendage limit in the HB and WB leagues. It was a different time. But Squidly was just tearing up the undersea leagues. Squidly Diddly was incredible. All arms and legs, great range. It would make sense that he would break the octopus barrier in the HB League. But in breaking the league's octopus barrier, Squidly endured many insults. They called him slimy or eight legs, and they threw fried calamari at him, but Squidly took it like an octopus. And I think people forget he couldn't even breathe air. He had gills. Squidly played all those games holding his breath. Now, if that's not determination, I don't know what is. He was a phenom. Wonderful player. And then off the field, he always gave back to the community. He donated two of his tentacles to a sick kid in Wisconsin. Saved his life. That's why he only has six. Squidly, I love you, man. Keep on rocking in the free world. I'm just glad that Squidly Diddly paved the way for other octopi. Well, actually, Squidly's the only octopus I know of to play the game. But the way is paved. Oh, the way is paved. Oh, yeah, the way is paved, definitely. The way is paved. Squidly Diddly, octopus, pioneer, way paver. Overall, the big game has enjoyed its fair share of success. It has basked in the warm glow of the accolades from pundits and fans alike. But like many heady young stars, the fame and glory went straight to the head of the big game. And when fame and glory fill your noggin, your noggin gets big, real big, and big noggins always goeth before a fall. They always goeth. Yeah, first of all, let me say, I love Popeye. You know, Popeye and I go way back, but everybody knew he was on the juice, everybody. Oh, it was a shame, a real shame. Popeye sang about it for crying out loud. I'm strong to the finish, cause I eat my spinach. I'm Popeye the sailor man. 
Popeye's a stand-up guy, but let me tell you something. He was up to three cans of spinach a day when I knew him. Three cans. Long-term effects of too much spinach could be uh, loss of vision, muttering, loss of hair. I am what I am, and that's all what I am. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. But that wasn't even the half of it. For the dirty little secret of another of the big game's most popular figures was about to be exposed. Well, the signs were there. I mean, all of a sudden, Top Cat starts tipping doormen with real quarters instead of slugs. He even started taking cabs all over the city for crying out loud. What was going on, of course, was the biggest gambling scandal the sport had ever seen. <laughs> it's not that big a leap to make. Top Cat was always looking for a get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> what can I say? We got greedy. Hey, TC! Say it ain't so, TC! Say it ain't so! Suddenly, Foghorn Leghorn saw all of his hard work. All he had built began to crumble. The big game was his baby, and it was being torn apart by its own success. Then, in 1980, a rookie ape named Magilla Gorilla was traded for an amount that I can't mention on a family program. I remember when McGill signed that contract. I mean, it was stupid fat, as the kids would say. It was insane in the membrane, totally la vida loca. You know, and the funny thing is, he never made it to the postseason after signing that deal. Too many bananas, I guess. Owners tried to cap players' salaries by introducing the Magilla Gorilla Clause. The ensuing strike of 81 almost toppled the league and destroyed the big game. Oh, sure, McGill made a lot, but the owners made even more. And while the big stars were getting the headlines, the rank-and-file players, Hardy Har Har, Buford, and the Galloping Ghost, were getting paid in peanuts. Literally. I know for a fact Peter Potamus was paid in peanuts. Come on, it's not like he's an elephant. But you know me, I'm pro-union. With their A-list players on strike, along with their B and C-list and the plumbers' union, the leagues were forced to scrape the bottom of the barrel. But it was going to get worse. Hence the big game of 83, the Trollkins versus Inch High Private Eye. The Trollkins, boy, did they stink. The big game of 84, I believe, was some cleanser mascot, Mr. Sanitary, and a sock puppet. Come on, that's not animation, and it's just not the real big game. Another year, they just showed an animated dental film. They built it as fluoride versus flat. Teddy. Did you know that brushing in little circles is better than just up and down? But no amount of brushing could get the bitter taste out of the fans' mouths toward the big game. It would take one heck of a mouthwash, clean, minty, with no medicine the aftertaste, to rebuild the work that had been undone. Sales were plummeting. The big game had hit rock bottom. There was nowhere to go but up. We'll be back right after these messages. Welcome back, everyone. If you're just tuning in, I'm your host, Jim Huber. If you've been watching the whole time, hi there, friend. Well, the 80s were finally over, which was bad news for John Hughes and the Rubik's Cube guy, but good news for the big game. The big game was in danger of becoming irrelevant in the world of sport, putting a real damper on T-shirt and sweatband sales. Foghorn was desperate. The strike was over, but he needed some marquee names, and fast. Foghorn Leghorn made some midnight phone calls, you know, cashed in a few favors. You know, he called up and said, I said, this is fo a Foghorn Leghorn. And just like that, the classics were back. Really got to give credit to Tom and Jerry. I mean, they played like a cat and mouse possessed that night. Jerry's got one of those big mixing spoons. A ladle. Yeah, and he's poking Tom with it. Boom, boom. And a nice pickup, even though he's not supposed to be on the couch. Now Jerry in the shotgun. He told us before the game he'd go to the run and shoot when he got behind. Interception. They're going to have to get the trainer out there and unjam that paw. One word sums up the level of play in Tom versus Jerry. Elegant. Tom's they played the yeah, an look, elegant just game. A big league hitting. Boom. The big game was big again. Then came big game 27. Sylvester versus Tweedy. Tweedy makes the snap. Sylvester sets. And Sylvester is shaken up on that play. I'll tell you, you have to tip your hat to him. 
He is not giving up this game. You know, Pat, we hear the phrase, hang in there, kid. He's thrown around a lot in this league. Well, I've talked to a lot of cats. And to a cat, they all say Sylvester is the one that hangs in there longer than... Okay, well, I never liked that poster anymore. Oh, with Sylvester versus Tweety, you had something else working. That dark, smelly place deep inside of us that hopes that cute little bird finally gets it. No. I don't think this is just me. Am I right? Attendance was up. The big game was, again, the focal point of the American psyche. Big game 28 could be the biggest yet, you know. I wouldn't miss this one for the world. Everybody's got to have this. Bring your, bring your cats, bring your dogs, bring everything. This is the big game. You got to bring it all to this game. There's no championship like the big game. It's unique, and I love it. Why is the big game so popular? You know, why does Bugs Bunny say, what's up, Doc? You know, it's, <laughs> you know? It's like, Grr! you know? It, it's, it's, Grr! you know? Why is the big game so popular? I can't answer that question. But you may find the answer in my new book, The Big Game. Why is it so popular? You know, I went to Tibet this summer. People riding bicycles would call out, big game guy, big game. That is really huge. When we get back from this important message, some final thoughts on the big game. Now you can own all the greatest moments from the big game. You mean me? Yes, you. Whoa, all right! For a limited time, Cartoon Network Sports is making available the big game, a look back special collector's leather bound edition. Tell me more. All of your favorite big game facts and trivia permanently preserved in hospital grade lucite. Hospital grade Lucite? <laughs> All right. Plus, you will receive a limited edition Sylvester versus Tweety phone slash clock radio for your trouble. I love Sylvester and Tweety. We love telephones. I love clock radios. Then you'll love the big game, a look back special collector's leather bound edition. Order yours today. Thank you, Cartoon Network Sports. From a doodle on a castor oil bottle in 1882, to a 100,000-seat stadium with 3.2 billion viewers worldwide. Big game has sure come a long way, baby. Let me leave you with a rather profound thought from the father of the big game, Mr. Foghorn Leghorn. The big game, Foghorn says, could be the game for the 2000s. You drop a piano on Elmer Fudd, it's no big deal. You drop a piano on Keyshawn Johnson, I got news for you, friend. He ain't getting up. Prophetic words from a visionary rooster. I'm Jim Huber. Thanks for watching The Big Game, A Look Back. We'll see you next year. And don't forget to watch Big Game 28, Roadrunner versus Coyote, right here on Cartoon Network. Good night, everybody.